Hi, this is Libby. And this is Roberta. And this is Art Blog Radio. Today we're speaking with Raphael Lozano Hammer. I hope that I, that I pronounced that correctly. Raphael is a Mexican born artist who lives in Montreal. He has a new public art piece opening on the Benjamin Franklin Parkway on September 20th. The piece is commissioned by the Association for Public Art, formerly known as the Fairmont Park Art Association, and Lozano Hemmer's piece is called Open Air. It involves 24 enormous spotlights that send beams of light into the night sky, and it involves people's cell phones. And what we want to know is the connection between the cell phones and those spotlights. Tell us about this new work. It's temporary. It's only going to be here for, I think, four weeks, is it? Correct, yeah. Can you describe it for us? Sure. Open Air is an interactive installation um, consisting of those 24 lights you were mentioning. These lights make this canopy of light that covers the entire parkway, but they can actually be seen, depending on atmospheric conditions, up to 10 miles away. So they're very quite, quite powerful and visible those lights are entirely controlled by the voices of participants. Anyone in the general public can use their smartphone uh, or a website to send a voice message to the lights, and then the lights uh, perform a dance or a design or a formation, if you will, that reacts specifically to the voice. So the computer, for example, listens to frequency and volume and intonation of the voice, and then the lights uh, react accordingly in position and in brightness. Um, but one of the nifty things about cell phone technology is that we know your position in the parkway. We know where you are because most smartphones have GPS tracking. And so the lights literally, when it's your turn to speak, they rotate to face you and they give you a private light show. So as people participate, they can listen to what others are saying. The idea of the messaging is not unlike, uh, let's say, a rant line or some kind of voicemail application, only instead of your voice ending up in some server, it's actually ending up in the night sky. So what if I don't have an iPhone? If you don't have an iPhone, then you can come to Eakins Oval, where we have a, a station, which is basically like a project headquarters, and you bring a piece of ID and we give you an iPhone for free so that you can try out the experience. You could also do it over online. So we have a website called openairphilly.net where you can send your messages and listen to the archive of messages. The only thing is that we give priority to somebody who's in the parkway with the phone because then they can see it live. And what are you hoping people will say? I mean, do you have expectations that they will say a certain thing? or? Um, not necessarily. I mean, in the past when we've do done participatory projects, one of the things that, I, that I'm always looking for is diversity. So in the past, not with voice, but for instance with text and with other sort of participation uh, strategies, what we have been getting is things like um, everything from dedications, people who dedicate uh, designs, uh, you know, there's poetry, there's statements, but there's also marriage proposals, there's sports scores and chants, there's people who rap. For me, the only thing that I'm trying to make sure is that the content is diverse and that it comes from different um, groups of people. So we're a little worried about the airplanes and the birds. Sure. Um, well, here's the thing is um, these searchlights, yes, they're very powerful, but they're also really uh, accurately controlled by a servo mechanism. It's basically like a robot, if you will. So we can very accurately tell those lights where to point and where not to point. We have an entire three-dimensional rendering of Philadelphia with all of the flight paths from air traffic control, as well as all of the buildings surrounding the parkway in such a way that we will make it impossible for any of our lights to ev ever impacting the neighbors, for example. We, we want them to love the show, not hate the, <laughs> the big flashing light. With the birds, it's a little bit more tricky because um, we're working with Audubon, Pennsylvania to ensure that migratory birds are not affected by, by the lights. We're learning a little bit from scientists, from ornithologists, how best to mitigate any, any potential factors. For example, in Tribute to Light, the 9-11 the memorial in New York City, there's a hundred searchlights which are pointed in two columns, of static columns of light. And what has been found by ornithologists is that the, that the birds actually are attracted by these lights 
and they get trapped in them. And so they actually get literally exhausted and they die. And the way that 9-11 Memorial is now fixing that and the way that we're certainly going to do it here is routinely we introduce blackouts, which then allow the birds to recapture or, their, or, or, or re uh, orient themselves and continue down their migratory path. So something as, as simple as a simple blackout allows the birds to not be trapped and, and be affected by How it. long does that blackout have to be? Um, that's something we're going to test. But like, for instance, in New York, I believe it's a few seconds. Uh, in ours, what we're going to do is we're going to make the blackout a part of the show. So every time a new performer comes in, a new voice goes into the lights, we're going to have a blackout of, say, a few seconds. Um, and it'll also be good because it'll be the timing. You know, you, you get a sense of, okay, next person, next person, next person. So it's like a cue. It's very technologically savvy. I mean, you have computer programs that you've written and f cell phone app that you've created all for this art project. So what's your background? Um, I have a strange background. I, I come uh, originally from science, so I have a degree in chemistry and um, I learned how to program there. But uh, most of my friends in university were composers and choreographers and writers and just arts people. So I was hanging out with the wrong crowd. And so I became uh, a part of a group uh, which did theater and I would help out by programming some audiovisual environments for the dancers to interact with. And then gradually I started entering the visual arts. Um, so now my work basically has two lines. Half of it is public art, like what we're doing in Philly. The other half is just conventional museum shows and gallery shows. Um, though the scale may be different between the two, the concepts and the concerns and the n sort of thematic background is this is similar. You know, the, 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 the pieces always... Uh, can relate to, to subjects that I keep coming back to. And what are those subjects? Um, it depends, but um, most, most of the time is the idea that at any given time there are several realities that are co-present, that at any given moment we are here and we are talking, but there's also in our back of our mind there's other people who are talking to who you are and, and, and you are made out of who you have read and that all of that information is in fact in touch with your listeners. The idea that if you scratch the surface of anybody, there's other realities that are at work. For, I'll give you an example, um, the electromagnetic spectrum. Um, the electromagnetic spectrum is a public space. It's the public space through which um, television and satellite telecommunications and air traffic control and taxi dispatch sequences happen. But the question of all of these different realities coexisting and being able to connect them or visualize them is of great interest to me. There's ghost-like presences, not so much so, uh, something mystical or something, uh, you know, paranormal, but rather um, something to do with memory and history and identity and politics. So most of the work that I'm doing is about connecting disparate realities, being able to translate, uh, in this case, voice into light, making it tangible and visible. But that all sounds very serious, but <laughs> when I look at your work, you know, and, and what you've been doing, it also has a playful quality and a spectacular quality, like, hello, it's Hollywood. <laughs> <laughs> sure, absolutely. And, and I, I, try to, I, I try and play both sides, you know. I, it's, a, it's, a, it's a fine line because on the one hand, there is the seduction of participation. There is the, oh, my God, my voice is controlling 240,000 watts of power and it can be heard by people throughout the city. On the other hand, there is the violence and the policing because ultimately the project is using things like GPS tracking. The system knows where you are located in the city and points all the lights at you, right? So it's kind of Orwellian, you know, as you walk around, you're not going to get rid of these lights that are over top of you and that are playing back your sound. As a Mexican, I'm, of course, this, this, this idea of the lights is... Um, it's, it's got both things. On the one hand, it's got this idea of spirituality or, you know, we have James Terrell, the, the incredible artist, this idea of inner light and spirituality and whatever. That's beautiful. But I'm equally interested in the light of violence, the light of interrogation, the light of these searchlights looking for Mexican immigrants at the border or this horrible group of people called the Minutemen 
who in Arizona track for Mexicans with his powerful spotlights. So to me, both are at work. Um, there will be uh, an acknowledgement that these technologies are not neutral and that this is not necessarily something that is going to liberate us from the predatory nature of some of these uh, technologies. Talk a little bit about the European tradition of Sonne Lumiere and how that works. And do you think what you're doing here is the equivalent of Sonne Lumiere? Well, the tradition of Sonne Lumiere is, is, is hundreds of years old. Um, the idea of having this kind of public spectacles that take place in the cities, usually financed by the governments as an idea to, to activate their towns and to get their citizens to be involved in the city. It's a beautiful tradition, and the French especially are masters at it. But uh, my work is very different than Sonne Lumiere, because Sonne Lumiere is based on a cathartic narrative. There's always a sense of pedagogy or didacticism that uh, you, you get to see a narrative that has a crescendo and ends in, in some kind of fireworks display. And this kind of orgasmic approach is not what I'm interested in at all, because I think that what it leads to is this passive contemplation. I believe in special effects, but there have to be special causes as well. There have to be special causes and effects. I believe that these artworks need to, first of all, if there's nobody participating, they need to be turned off. Right. I think uh, this applies to Sonne Lumiere, but it applies to fountains too. The perfect state for a fountain is it should not be working unless there's somebody in front of it. The, the second thing is that it should not happen in a proscenium. So the proscenium and this idea of having like a privileged vantage point to the show is one that is, of course, based on the, the, the privilege of the select elite who are VIPs who get a special take or a special positioning to view the show. This is very often the case, even in fireworks displays. Whereas what I'm interested in is in creating a panorama, a landscape, something that does not have one location to view it, rather than something that takes over, almost like a treatment, the city. And the final one has to do with um, it not being pre-programmed. So a Sonne Lumiere show follows a narrative, usually what Said would call a, an identitarian narrative that tells people what they are. Whereas what I'm interested in doing is in having no narrative. The, the narrative must emerge out of an ad hoc improvisation from the participants. And this makes my work no less political. It's just that instead of it being the politics of identity and national representation and all that other silliness, it's trying to play out the politics of personal relationships in the city and in the street. So let's talk about politics. Yeah, Did you grow sure. up <laughs> speaking political thoughts and having arguments at your dinner table when you were a kid? No, not really. My parents were uh, nightclub owners in Mexico City, and um, they were interested in a good party. They were people who were very experimental. My mother was married six times, and so we had a variety of different stepdads to to deal with, uh, my dad three times. So my, my background is more a very chaotic kind of uh, mishmash. Um, the politics comes more from just, I mean, now that I'm a dad, I realize that there's other ways to approach the creation of family, the creation of community, the creation of certain kind of personal responsibility. Now, most of the artists that I admire, people like Christian Wojcicki and Johan Gers and Rachel Whiteread and Hans Hakes, they make absolutely stunning works that are committed and politically critical and engaged. So it's not just that I want to be like them. I mean, I think that they're doing such an incredible job um, that it, it's the kind of thing that, that makes me passionate about what we're doing. Call it romantic or idealistic or what, y what have you, but the belief that what we're doing can have an impact in the fabric of society. Again, not capital P politics, but just the politics of temporary relationships that are ephemeral and that take place from the bottom up. Thank you so much. We've been <laughs> on that note, that wonderful <laughs> note. We're going to say thank you so much for speaking with us. It's We've been my speaking pleasure. with Rafael Lozano Hemmer. I'm sorry I okay. slaughtered your name. <laughs> Again, thank you so much. Thank you. Yes. Thank you. All right, my pleasure. Art Blog Radio is brought to you by theartblog.org. Thanks to our sponsors, including the Knight Foundation. Also, we want to thank Peter Crimmins, who makes us sound good. He's our editor. And thanks to Eric Biondo for his music. You can download these podcasts at theartblog.org slash radio.